Okay, if you're still following along, we're going through uh, chapter by chapter as an outline. Uh, chapter 3 of Rapid Interpretation of EKG. I encourage you to get the book, follow along. Basically, this chapter is just a cardiac physiology refresher, so we're going to go through it pretty quickly. You'll remember that the autonomic nervous system has two branches, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The parasympathetic releases acetylcholine on t and act acts on cholinergic receptors, while the sympathetic, the important mechanism, uh, it uses the norepinephrine on adrenergic receptors. You'll know that there are other stimulants of adrenergic receptors, for example, epinephrine, which is produced primarily by the adrenal glands and not used nearly as much as norepinephrine is when we're talking about cardiac physiology. But when the adrenal glands do produce it, uh, it will act on the heart, but it's not through the nervous system so much as it's through the blood. Okay, so what are we doing in the heart, specifically in the heart? We're activating beta-1 adrenergic receptors, and this is going to increase the rate of the SA node firing, so the, the firing pace of the node is going to increase, so heart rate's going to go up. It's also going to increase conduction through the AV node, so that's going to be required for this SA node uh, to increase the heart rate in the ventricles. Next, it's, uh, it's going to act on the myocytes themselves to increase their contractility, make them not only pump faster, but pump harder. And then it's going to impact junctional automaticity, which I'm not going to explain what that is. Uh, exactly now, um, Dubbin gets into it in like chat, uh, page 113 or something like that. Just important to know that norepinephrine is going to increase the irritability of junctional automaticity and acetylcholine is going to decrease the irritability. Then also it's important to know that epinephrine is, uh, has a greater activity, a greater affinity for these beta-1 receptors than norepinephrine does. So if you're um, in that fight or flight mode, the epinephrine is going to be the major mechanism of increased heart rate and stuff and not necessarily the norepinephrine. Okay, so the ACH, acetylcholine is going to act on cholinergic receptors. It's going to decrease. It's the exact opposite of norepinephrine. Decrease the rate of SA node firing. Decrease conduction through the AV node. Decrease contractility of the myocardium. Decrease junctional irritability. And all of this acts through basically the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is your heart's parasympathetic nerve. You'll also remember that the vagus nerve acts on the bowel, the stomach, the bowel, and that kind of thing. And so you remember vomiting, you remember diarrhea, stuff like that. That's all vagus nerve. Now, norepinephrine also will act on the arteries, uh, specifically arterioles, but it's going to, in the arteries, it's going to act through alpha-1 receptors. So remember there's alpha-1, alpha-2, there's beta-1, beta-2, and you'll remember that um, the lungs, if, you're, if you act on the beta-2 receptors in the lungs. It's uh, how you treat asthma. The way you can remember this is that you have two lungs but one heart, so beta-1 is in the heart. And then arterial, alpha-1, arterial, you're looking at the arteries. And what it does, it's going to constrict. And so you just think of the adrenergic nervous system. It wants to increase the blood pressure. So how are you going to do that? You make the vessel smaller. Blood pressure is going to go up. So blood pressure actually goes up because of increased vascular resistance and from increased heart rate. So there's two things going on there. And we can actually map all of that out, both of these uh, terms, through something called Passau's Law, and I've written it over here. So the flow rate, the flow rate's going to be equal to the change in pressure over the resistance. And then we can define resistance as 8 times the viscosity times the length over pi times the radius to the fourth. So if we take this and insert it into this equation, basically what we get is this, where uh, the Q got changed, F got changed to Q, but we'll just keep it as F. The flow rate is equal to the change in pressure times pi times radius to the fourth times eight times eta times the length. Eta is the viscosity, L is the length, R is the radius of the vessel. And so we can see what happens to blood pressure by multiplying everything through. So flow times 8 times eta times length divided by pi times the radius to the fourth is equal to the change in pressure. Now we look that the vessel diameter, the radius, is down here on the bottom and so if you divide by a very small number then 
you're going to make the number bigger. So like if I take the number 2 and I divide it by 1 half, then it goes up. It goes, it becomes 4. But if I take 2 and I divide it by, by 4, then it goes down. It becomes 1 half. So if I divide by a very small number, my pressure will go up. If I divide by a very large number, my pressure will go down. So by making the radius very small, I increase the pressure to the fourth power. And then if we look at this other term, flow, flow is basically talking about your cardiac output. And you remember that cardiac output is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. So how fast is my heart beating and, and how strongly is it squeezing? And all of these things work together to in, so the increased heart rate and contractility, the increased vascular resistance, all of these things are going to change the pressure differential. Now let's talk about a few clinical pearls. The parasympathetic activity, um, you can have, for example, extreme pain, or some people, whenever they see their own blood, they have parasympathetic activity. This is called a vasovagal reflex, sometimes called vasovagal syncope. And it can cause them to pass out. The reason they pass out is because, uh, first of all, their arterials go from really small to really uh, wide, and their heart rate goes way down. And they don't get, while they're standing there, they're not getting all the blood up to their brain, and they just pass out. There's something called a vagal maneuver. Um, so what you can do is you can have GI stimulation by gagging, or you can do um, pr uh, carotid massage for the carotid sinus. And this will stimulate a uh, vagal release of acetylcholine, and it can be used diagnostically or therapeutically. For example, you may need somebody's heart rate to slow down. Uh, you may need it to happen really fast. You do that carotid uh, massage, and perhaps it can cause the heart rate to slow down. thing you need to be aware of with carotid massage, if someone has atherosclerosis, you have a really high chance of breaking off and, and dislodging some type of, uh, of plaque into their brain and causing them to have a stroke. So this is something you want to be very careful about. But maybe you just gag the person instead. I don't know. So how do the baroreceptors and everything work? So you have the carotid sinus, um, which is your baroreceptor inside the carotid artery. That goes up through cranial nerve 9 into the brain. And if, it, if the pressure is really high, it's going to stimulate parasympathetic activity in the brain and come back down through the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10. If the pressure is really low, it's going to stimulate sympathetic activity. Same thing with the aortic arch. It goes up through cranial nerve 10 in the same pathway. If pressure is really low, it's going to stimulate sympathetic. If it's really high, it's going to stimulate parasympathetic. And this is how the body maintains homeostasis. So for example, upon standing, you get reduced pressure. It causes reflex sympathetic activation. Then, of course, people that have orthostatic hypotension, it's a failure of one of these mechanisms to fix the, the changes in pressure. So when you stand up, you have less pressure going up. And this is basic, that's basic physics. If you don't understand it, I go review a physics textbook. But essentially, if you have water, the pressure is, is higher at, at the bottom than it is at the top. So low pressure up here, high pressure down here. And so if your body is basically like a thing of water, then by laying down, all the pressures are basically near equal. By standing up, you're getting low pressure at the top. The last thing that Dubbin points out is something uh, called neurocardiogenic syncope. This is the same thing as the vasovagal reflex. Anytime you pass out because your brain tells your heart to stop moving, uh, stop beating as fast. Uh, that's basically vasovagal reflex. And in his, uh, the last uh, explanation, he says that elderly people will get pooling of blood down in their feet if they stand for a long time. And this will cause uh, low pressure uh, to be experienced in some places and high pressures to be experienced in other places. And what you get is a paradoxical activation of the parasympathetic nervous system which causes a neurocardiogenic uh, syncope. Anyhow, with all of the neurocardiogenic syncopes, a tilt table test is used. Uh, Dubbin called it the head up tilt test. And that basically covers everything that we need for the uh, physiology review. If you want to know more about this, Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine, 19th edition, um, volumes 1 and 2 combined, uh, page 146, and I, I think that's chapter 27. It has a little spread on causes of 
neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, which uh, it basically is describing what Dubman described. 